Welcome back to class. This is the second session of race and culture studies or introduction to race and ethnicity. And this course is based on the textbook Doing Race. So hopefully by now you've had time to um, get your textbook Doing Race 21 Essays for the 21st Century. Uh, where we left off last time was with the definition for race, culture, and ethnicity. Those three definitions being very different, but of course being related, and yet those differences between the, the words are important to note. So hopefully you're able to kind of digest those definitions. And now we're going to be jumping into chapter three and four. And the third and fourth chapters, um, you know, each chapter again is a separate essay. So each chapter has a unique perspective on the topic of race and ethnicity. And in this session, we are going to examine the role of science, technology, and medicine on the topic of race. So it's a commonly held belief that race is a biological reality. And in chapter three, Marcus Feldman discusses DNA, genomic variation and race, and he talks about phenotypes, which are the observable features or what we see in humans. And basically this is just like the outward appearance and what does the eye or the visual um, perception tell us about a person. So he, di he discusses how from a scientific perspective, um, phenotypes are never important to note, never um, attributable to genes alone. So I'll repeat that. Phenotypes are never attributable to genes alone. I know it's really hard to unlearn a lot of things that have just been, you know, really indoctrinated into our minds about race. Um, but bear with me, we're gonna go through some of the science behind this. Um, not only in Feldman's essay, but also in the next chapter, um, Barbara Koenig also discusses some of this and she has a different perspective than Marcus Feldman too. So um, the idea of ge genetic information not dictating or defining race is, is basically like it undermines the very fundamental idea of biological race, which is also known as race essentialism, that is that race is coded in your DNA, that it's a fate you're born into, that there's nothing you can do about it, and that um, not only um, is race coded in your DNA as far as hair type, physical features, these kinds of things that are racialized, but also that it has a connection with um, moral values, with behavior, with intelligence, and most um, sinisterly with, with the potential or tendency toward criminality. So there's no scientific basis for those assumptions, yet people have tried over and over again to prove and billions of dollars have been spent on race science or racialized medicine and research to attempt to racially code human beings, even though those experiments have time and time again led to the same conclusion that human beings cannot be divided into races because we are more similar than we are different on a biological level. So many scientists um, begin actually their research or their experiments, as we'll see in this lesson, based on an assumption about race or with a racial bias. And so th that shapes the experiments and the research. And therefore you're starting with the conclusion instead of discovering the conclusion and that's not science. So um, the bias stems from, of course, historic racism, which suggests that again, these observable features or phenotypes um, are connected to behavior, intelligence, IQ, moral character, criminality, etc. So let's be clear again that the small fraction of genomic variation that determines things like your eye color, 
or your how much melanin you have. We all have one skin color, it's called melanin, so you either have more or less of that. Um, hair type, like how curly your hair is, uh, facial features and so on, have n absolutely nothing to do scientifically with historic biases about behavior, intelligence, um, moral character, criminality, etc. So we'll see in some of the PowerPoint slides later on in this lesson how scientists or so-called sci so -called scientists um, claiming to do objective research have really shaped the outcomes of their experiments by beginning with racial bias, by beginning the science process or scientific process or research process from the standpoint of racism. So some people use um, what they have heard of Darwinian evolution as a basis for racism. Some people use the Bible in terms of um, the idea of Noah and his sons and the curse of Ham as a basis for racism. Um, the Aryan nations even use the idea of Eve um, mating with the serpent to create all non-white races and so therefore the only human races or race is even Adam's kids and even Adam were white is that myth. So there are a lot of myths out there. Some of them sound super crazy but then others we have actually swallowed and we are performing or behaving on a daily basis as if they are true. So one of the ones that's a little bit harder or a little bit subtler to kind of debunk is the Darwinian evolution myth. Um, the myth that Darwin actually ordered species in terms of evolution and that somehow humans evolved from, you know, monkeys. Therefore, then what happened is that it, during the colonial era, they kind of, you know, assumed, okay, so therefore the hierarchy of so-called human races is going to start with lower, the lower categories go up to the higher categories, which are white, lower categories are dark. And so we're going to, you know, have this almost like value chart on the basis of lightness and darkness of skin tone and certain facial features and so on. So um, non-scientists actually just used some of Darwin's ideas, but not his complete ideas as a basis for racism or as a basis for justifying their racism. But important to note, and um, Marcus Feldman discusses this in chapter three, that Darwin himself in The Descent uh, of Man, his work said about race, quote, it may be doubted whether any character can be named which is distinctive of race, any biological character. He added variability of all the characteristic differences between the races indicates that these differences cannot be of much importance. In other words, um, Darwin did not believe in hierarchy of races. He said the, the differences that are between groups of people that we are calling races is not even that important, nor is it the basis for um, making an idea that, you know, creating an idea that a race is a biological thing um, that's different from another human race because those differences aren't very important and there is no distinctive characteristic that can actually be named which will define one race over or against another. So during, during Darwin's studies, also keep in mind that scientists could not agree and still can't agree how many races there are. You know, when they're trying to divide the human race into races, there has forever been a conundrum because it's so difficult to prove and yet they try again and again. So during Darwin's time, um, some scientists were saying there are only two races, black and white. Some scientists were saying there were as many as 63 races. And Johann Blumenbach grouped races into five categories, which became kind of a popular sort of trend. Um, but other scientists have 
come, you know, from a different perspective with just like there's, you know, the, the evidence that there's no actual um, requirement, there's no, the requirement has not been met for division of human races. So all these scientists are kind of arguing about this and there still has yet to be a conclusion, yet we pretend that there's a conclusion because we just kind of repeat what we hear. Um, but, you know, moving forward, we're gonna look at why we have heard what we hear and what the intentions are behind racializing human beings. So not thousands, not millions, but billions of dollars have been spent on hum human DNA research and that research trying to prove the biological reality of race, which has yet to be proved. So the question we might ask is why have people spent billions and billions of dollars? We're gonna look in chapter four at one reason why this is important for scientists. Keep in mind that 0.37% of medical research funds have gone to non-white medical researchers. And again, I'm using white in the nominal sense of the identification of groups or of people, but research funds, typically all of these billions of dollars are going to um, nominally white researchers who are trying to prove that race is an essential difference between humans. So what is so urgent and necessary about proving this when about 5% of 3 billion DNA units make up the human genome? So we have 3 billion DNA units, but we're going to focus on a tiny little fraction of those um, in what we call continental ancestry groups in these DNA tests currently. And uh, we're going to then attach those continental ancestry groups with our ideas of race. And when it comes down to um, continental ancestry groups, there are 6,000 continental ancestry groups, and we know that there have never been 6,000 socially constructed races. So um, what we do is then we, we simplify all that data into and collapse it into our ideas of these limited racial groups that have been socially manufactured for the purpose of oppression, for the purpose of social hierarchy, and so forth. So in um, one of the studies that Marcus Feldman talks about, the HAPMAT study, it was limited to, that study started being limited to four groups, four so-called racial groups, and that was kind of um, similar to that earlier five group ranking. So in the 1990s, then it was kind of, the hat mat was kind of questioning and there was a um, new idea from scientists that we should actually study samplings from each language around the world. And then we're going to group people into those languages. So what they did was study 25 people um, collect evidence or biological material from 25 people from each language around the world. Um, I, I probably don't have to tell you because <laughs> this is pretty common sense. Um, sampling 25 people that speak English is not going to tell you anything about biological similarities or differences when it comes down to, you know, human bodies because you could sample 25 people that speak English um, anywhere in the world and those like you could have a different 25 people with all these different outcomes depending on which 25 people you pick. So um, that particular collection of data although it was considered to be the most comprehensive it still doesn't test for race and even if we're talking about like well that you know, the scientists say it's the most comprehensive collection of data, <laughs> even though it was only 25 people from each language. But, um, you know, when it comes down to it, there also was shown to be a gap in indigenous groups of people, collection of data from indigenous groups, because in some cultures, like giving your blood or your DNA material, 
like you don't you don't just hand that over to a stranger or to a researcher or to a scientist so um, there is a hesitancy to participate in certain indigenous groups which then of course skewed some of the um, results in addition to it also being based on language alone so there is um, this kind of you know this term race really is describing more social dynamics than it is describing um, actual biological material and when we cut when we say you know race we're talking more about how I'm gonna behave towards you or you're gonna to behave toward me on the basis of perceived co-belonging or not belonging you know to each other's so-called racial group so, you know, usually it's for the purpose of inclusion or exclusion, for the purpose of, um, you know, deciding how one individual or one group is gonna to behave towards a person. So the next time someone says like, race is in your blood or race is biological, ask them why is there more difference, as Marcus Feldman discusses in chapter three, more difference biologically or scientifically, scientifically within racial groups than between them so what we call a racial group there is scientifically more difference within that group than there is between that group and another group that we are classifying as a different race um, and he also discusses and kind of shows like the 94 percent of variations for specific traits occur within populations with only three to four percent occurring between the populations of even different continents. So not just black and white in America, which are gonna be way more similar because of the similar diet and climate and so forth, but like, you know, two continents on either side of the world, there is still only gonna be, um, there's gonna be 94% difference um, within each of those groups, whereas only three or 4% difference between those groups. So in other words, we are more similar than we are different, once again. Um, but to, to further complicate this whole process of trying to racialize medicine and science, uh, samples of human populations that these, these uh, research methods are based on have also been skewed in other ways. For example, when they chose to um, examine European Americans, they went to Utah and sampled European Americans in Utah. And when they, when science, this, the, the science, this particular scientific study that Marcus Feldman is talking about um, went to Africa to sample African populations, which the continent is actually the most diverse um, genetically on, on the planet because it has all the genes for everything because that's where human life originated. But uh, these researchers went to Nigeria, so that was going to be the African group, and the European American group was going to be out of Utah, and then, you know, Japanese people are going to be in Japan, and so it's like, well, what about a, you know, African American in Utah <laughs> versus maybe a Japanese person living in um, Nigeria or whatever? Like, it didn't, like, the test did not allow for globalization and it didn't didn't actually take into consideration again um, diet lifestyle climate regions and how those things affect uh, populations and the biological uh, nature of human beings which oftentimes is as we have seen you know way more significant with that 94 percent within groups versus three percent between so Anyway, the designation of race in America today is, has more to do with, again, social designation than it does with ancestry. But we keep pretending that, of course, it has to do more with ancestry. And when it comes to the one drop of black blood makes you black, that is a historical precedent for social identification that has been shaped by the white majority. And Feldman discusses, you know, in his chapter that you know, that shaping of if you have one drop of black, black blood, meaning if you have a black ancestor, um, we're gonna call you black. If you don't, we're gonna call you white. That was shaped by the white population um, 
for the purpose of maintaining power and privilege around the idea of race. And since we actually all come from the same continent, Africa, you know, we all have um, ancestors eventually that would would be called black under the race worldview. So it's, it's you know, when you really start breaking it down, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So on um, page 146, there is a figure, which I'm gonna show you a little diagram or, or um, discussion about migration of human beings and how um, human beings came out of Africa and then populated the world and what those dates look like. So when we're talking about race, the idea of race, we're clearly skipping human history and we're just moving everything toward the, you know, what we're gonna pick and choose over certain periods of time um, to build these socially constructed ideas of race around. So let's go ahead and look at that, um, that diagram really quickly. So this is the diagram of human migration. And as you can see, approximately 100,000 years ago, um, humans started migrating out of East Africa. And then this just kind of shows, this is in years ago. So the more recent migration into North America and South America and so forth. So this is your history and um, also, just not only is what shows how human beings were sort of broken into groups, but also shows in, in rewind fashion, in reverse order, um, how we all go back to the same origins and have, you know, that commonality in ancestry. So some of the information in the PowerPoint was actually derived from intro introduction to African American studies uh, textbook. So I'm cross-listing some textbooks, which I'll reference at the end of this entire lesson. Um, and this kind of shows the cross-section of, you know, how race, biology, and medicine became attached to the social Darwinianism or, or social sciences. So how like biology and medicine got sort of confused and clouded by social ideas of white supremacy. And Hitler, of course, and anti-Semitism also derives its origins from those ideas of like the myth of white supremacy and American eugenics, as well as the race worldview. So the illustration in the top right corner is, um, you know, kind of, kind of drives at that connection between um, the false connection between Darwin's ideas who you know Darwin describes and, and claims like he does not actually believe in um, racial differences as being anything important but um, that people kind of used his ideas of evolution to create visual propaganda that showed like animal evolution into human evolution with the ultimate human evolution being white at the top and the connection or the almost like the link the missing link between species or something was the black population so this is a very sinister and racist view of course of um, human grouping and creates a hierarchy that then became the basis for a lot of oppression also to note while going through this textbook doing race is um, kind of a pro-black perspective or black studies perspective about race biology and medicine is that all people ultimately should have access to um, the participation in medicine and technology and on their own terms. And also like when it comes to experimentation and medical practices, consent is is crucial as well as the opportunity to participate as full partners in transforming society and technology and not having just one group driving the the technology and the science and the medicine but you know include being inclusive and equitable um, not just in in um, the way medicine is practiced but in the way medicine is developed and the way that we think about biology because this is the only way to really improve 
quality of life and empower people to control their own destinies and have everyone at the table to, you know, really sort out what is accurate without some, some sort of a imbalanced um, racial bias. So in the next few slides, we're going to look at how science and technology have been used to oppress, because that's something missing from the two chapters that we're looking at in doing race. So why people are worried about the future, why we are worried about the future when it comes to equity, inclusion, and justice. So what has been lauded as a gain for science and technology sometimes has come at a loss to um, African Americans throughout American history. So, for example, the invention of the cotton gin led to 70% increase in enslaved African people from 698,000 to 1.2 million. The invention of reapers, combines, and tractors um, led to thousands of black sharecroppers losing land and work and uh, firearm advancement, specifically assault weapons and military technology. Um, also came with the then prohibitions in the South, so inequity uh, for blacks to own certain firearms. And so just putting those weapons in, in the hands of uh, one group versus other groups. And then factory advancement in growing American cities. Um, blacks were relegated to lowest status and most dangerous jobs during those, those uh, factory expansions and development. And then Finally, in this slide, advancement in architectural safety and construction and urban planning. Um, this was, again, a, a gain for some, but in black neighborhoods established in areas most prone to storm damage, um, there, you know, the architecture was oftentimes poorly designed buildings. So like in Mississippi flood of 1927, um, blacks were actually even held by armed guards as the waters rose. Um, they were not allowed to leave during that flood. And then Hurricane Katrina in Galveston, Texas in 1900. There are so many other examples of ways in which um, urban planning has, has come at a gain for some, but at a loss for others. So moving forward, some, some additional gains uh, versus losses have been weapons technology and bombing from planes, um, led to the elimination of Black Wall Street in 1921. 44 city blocks were destroyed. Um, Black Wall Street, there's a little picture on this um, slide that says, you know, kind of describes like 600 businesses, 21 churches, 21 restaurants, 30 grocery stores, two movie theaters, six private airplanes, uh, one hospital, one bank, its own school system. There was a, you know, a great deal of wealth in Black Wall Street that was destroyed. Um, due to this increase, again, in technology. Next, um, public housing in Section 8 was kind of a gain for urban planning and development, but public housing shows segregated results with whites us using or being allowed to use Section 8 vouchers away from poor neighborhoods, but not the same opportunity for blacks to do so. And voter redistricting and vote counting technology was an advancement with electronic methods and new machines and faster counting methods, but this has led to disenfranchisement of voters and strategically breaking up specific districts that tend to vote with what um, politicians call black interests and um, aka community interests in mind rather than corporate interests. So in this slide, we're going to also look at um, science and technology as well as medicine. Um, number nine here is surveillance and police technological advancements showing a loss for um, African Americans with a greater use of surveillance in black neighborhoods, sometimes specifically um, targeting within those communities, such as when the hip hop artists were targeted in 2004 in New York City. Um, so targeting specific demographics with that technological advancement of surveillance. Number 10 discusses the surgical and pharmaceutical advancement and innovation, um, actually several innovations and advancements in surgery and, and drugs, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, but the loss was medical experimentation on black bodies specifically before chattel slavery ended, 
um, slaves were clinically test material um, for these research projects. And even after emancipation um, in 1930, proper treatment to cure syphilis was found and medical scientists believed blacks had smaller brains than whites and claimed that if left untreated, syphilis would therefore attack the muscles of blacks. Well, syphilis actually attacked the brains of whites. And so they um, tried to prove again that race was so different, that black bodies and white bodies were so different that they could prove that this particular disease would attack um, the brains of whites because that was their dominant feature, whereas it would attack the muscles of blacks because that was their dominant feature under the race worldview. And so they experimented on 400 to 600 black men in Tuskegee, Alabama, and they claimed to give them treatment, but they weren't treating them at all. And so the study ultimately, of course, failed and did not prove that there were genetic differences in the way that syphilis um, affected blacks and whites. Um, But the loss was, of course, about 600 people um, were not only um, maimed by the experiment, but some even died. So as we move through these um, numbers, you know, we can really see that there's a huge um, casualty effect. And that's why Dorothy Roberts wrote her book, Fatal Invention. That's why the title is called Fatal Invention, because by saying that there are very real consequences to the myth of race in medicine when it comes to um, how scientists are operating on human bodies, that is, is no exaggeration. Uh, the race worldview has been a fatal invention. And if you want to read more about how science and medicine is involved, the book to, or the two books to look for really are Killing the Black Body as well as Fatal Invention by Dorothy Roberts, both of which I'll, I'll source at the end of this um, lesson. So moving forward, um, number 12, National Institute for Health conducts a scientific study on violence and genetics in the 1990s. However, the scientific study selected only black children ages five through nine to see what was, quote, defective about them. Instead of looking at underlying social causes of violent crime, there was, again, a, uh, an effort made to link crime to genetics by only sampling and researching black children. Number 13, medical researchers invent new hypnotic sedatives, tranquilizers, and psychotropic drugs, and in... Um, experimenting with these drugs, a lot of times prison inmates are disproportionately black, are the test subjects for this medical research. And again, the invention of sterilization methods for women was a gain in terms of population control, but was instead of being used in an equitable way, um, weaponized against black women, some as young as 10 years old, being forced to undergo sterilization in the 1960s and 70s. And as we'll see on the next slide, Um, other populations as well being targeted. Number 15, racial medicine, the invention of uh, specific medicines for black patients or members of specific uh, so-called racial groups and approximately 30 race-specific drugs uh, being under development in recent years without evidence of biological racial difference or accountability for the effects of those drugs on real patients in real time. Part of, part of American history that's not usually talked about much is uh, forced sterilization. And the United States was the first country to undertake forced sterilization programs for the purpose of eugenics, which means to eliminate certain groups of people um, or their biologically inheritable traits. 65,000 black women were sterilized in 33 states, some of the girls as young as 10 years old, as we talked about in the last slide, and most were not aware at the time what was actually being done to them, so this was not done with consent. Uh, Many were in the hospital for another reason and were like sterilized without being informed. Um, Sterilization of Native women and Latina women has also um, been a trend within racialized medicine and has led to some indigenous tribes actually being virtually eliminated. So a lot of this just leads to an overall distrust of medicine and um, a lot of people don't want to participate in some of the medical research or even DNA tests for fear that it will be weaponized against them, either their own DNA weaponized against them or um, that the 
the um, data accrued is not going to be used for the purposes of equity, justice, and inclusion, but actually for the purposes of um, pushing forward racist agendas. So the, there's good reason for this distrust, and I don't think it is going to dissolve until more black professionals and pro-black professionals are involved in biomedical research and implementation of healthcare. Again, there's a negative 99.63% disadvantage when it comes to um, black scientists actually participating in those in the medical research process biomedical research so um, and this is not just a black and white issue clearly this applies to all groups who have been racialized that there is just a huge um, disproportionality in terms of the funding and the personnel making these decisions. So Africana Studies courses as core components, or race and ethnicity courses as core components of medical degree fields could be one solution. Um, encouragement and exposure of Africana Studies as a minor or double major for those seeking healthcare degrees or STEM, entering STEM fields. And integration of relevant in information into other curricula with with accountability measures. And I actually really firmly believe that race and ethnicity, you know, this history, this human history that we have and the science behind the that connects with the history should be taught throughout K through, you know, K through 12, not just um, waiting for somebody to choose a, a minor or to choose to take a class in college. I think this is core information that is at the heart of, being kind to one another, at the heart of cultivating compassion and leading to equitable and inclusive practices. So now we're going to switch gears for a moment and go back to the textbook for, um, this has all been information derived from Introduction to Africana Study, African American Studies by Talmadge Anderson, which I'll reference at the end of the course or the end of this lesson, um, because I really wanted to just kind of poke in a third perspective in this discussion of DNA and um, biological aspects of racialization because the two essays that are on this topic in the book were by non-black writers. So I wanted to kind of like include that voice here um, in the discussion. So let's look back at chapter four. So as we move into chapter four now, um, I wanted to mention to you that because this chapter is more medicine based and Marcus Feldman was talking about technology, about acquiring or um, collecting and researching DNA and so forth. So science and technology, now we're switching gears a little bit more toward a medical perspective um, in Barbara Koenig's essay in chapter four. But to transition, um, I wanted to note that Marcus Feldman did expose that assumptions that differences between people who belong to different ancestry groups contributes to the added risk of disease from genes is likely to be modest, small, or very small. So he, he, just, he did touch on some of the um, scientific evidence around medicine, but didn't talk exclusively or primarily about disease. Barbara Koenig is going to make a case for why she thinks we should keep the race worldview, but somehow undo or separate the medical from medical and scientific ideas about human beings um, from the social concepts about race that people are comfortable with. So in other words, let people continue to believe that race is biological or whatever, you know, just let society be, but we need to transform the way that scientists or researchers um, practice their experiments and practice medicine because um, clearly when it comes down to how populations are diagnosed and treated medically, race does not play a, a very big role at all. So if, if any, in most circumstances. So um, my question about her proposition is whether or not it's realistic to expect doctors and scientists to make that clean division between their like where their racial bias stops and where science is 
being shaped objectively. I don't have faith that people are going to make that distinction. So I really believe that the race worldview needs to be undone and that we need to stop practicing race in society as if it's a real biological thing. But this is her perspective. And again, you know, honoring all the different perspectives in this textbook. Um, so she kind of talks about when it comes to health, um, do genetics play the biggest role or does lifestyle, poverty, food, culture, activity, things like depression and other social factors contribute more to overall health and disease and medicine? Um, which of these social factors then are also linked to the social idea of race or to statistical disparities between groups? Um, that have happened in and because of the race worldview as people practice racialization and those hierarchies throughout history um, and how many of those factors are actually linked to like biology or genetics. So on page 173, Koenig shows that one of the main reasons that race is redefined in medicine time and again is that race is seen as having monetary value for pharmaceutical products. So there is big money to be made in racializing human beings, not only just from a perspective of media politics and sensationalism and creating, you know, race conflict, but also from the standpoint of medicine because um, there's a lot of possibility for selling medicine if we, can, if we can have a group believe that they are biologically so different from another group that they need a specific type of medicine, then we can sell more medicine to that group, if that makes sense. So there's a, there's a um, very sinister thing under, underscoring or intention underscoring the pharmaceutical uh, process of researching or developing racialized medicine and racialized drugs because a lot of these are um, have resulted in misdiagnosis miss uh, or improper treatment and in some cases even death because of these assumptions about race as they are connected then to medical practice so one example of the problem with racializing medicine is the idea of black blood. And it, we talked about that, that one drop rule being social practice in America created by the white majority, et cetera, for purposes of oppression. But black blood in a medical sense then was also segregated. So there is an apartheid of blood in not just America, but in other countries as well. We know that South Africa kind of followed suit with a lot of the Jim Crow practices in America under their apartheid, but in a medical field, um, the black blood versus white blood, there is a segregation of blood, not based on blood types, but based on race. Um, so, Blood was segregated and even to the point where the American Red Cross refused to send black blood to troops in World War II um, because they did not want to contaminate, contaminate the you know, racial purity of um, white soldiers. So this is, again, not based on science. It's based on our feelings about difference in our assumptions about the biology of race, which as we can see have been false assumptions. So only after dismantling the idea of racial purity when it comes to blood samples and blood transfusion um, was in the civil rights movement was blood actually desegregated and shared between so-called races. Um, this reminds me of in 2015, I mean, I, I heard from so many people around the world, just emails and messages and, you know, everybody has their personal story around the race topic. So this, this one individual, um, contacted me and 
said, you know, hey, I've always felt like I could claim to be black under the one drop rule because I had a blood transfusion. This was a nominally white male um, who had a blood transfusion uh, that saved his life and the blood donor was a black woman. And so, you know, he was like, my life was saved by black blood. <laughs> and it sounds kind of kind of funny, like, oh, okay, so you have more than one drop of black blood um, in you, you know, coursing through your veins. But in a sense though, this really, and so many other examples really um, defy that whole myth of somehow, you know, our blood, you know, between groups, blood is not, you know, able to mix or it's, you know, you can't give an organ or um, blood or, you know, other medical treatments like, you know, in a desegregated sense. So again, the, the idea was not medical in its basis. The idea was racist in its basis that black blood is different and therefore is separate. Um, so finally, let's talk about politics and media because in Barbara Koenig's discussion, not only does do big pharmaceutical companies benefit from perpetuating the idea of race, but also um, the media and politicians benefit from the polarization, the binary categories of black and white and of race in America. So on page 175, um, Koenig discusses how journalists who are not experts in science, who are not experts in medicine, oversimplify or misinterpret complex medical findings in order to translate them while reporting to the public. So journalists are connecting what they hear about a medical study, complex medical findings and scientific research they're gonna connect that with their own personal racial bias, whether for or against certain groups or whatever, and then they're going to output a translation of that um, to the public. And for example, historically, like the New York Times actually um, played a major role in encouraging blood segregation, um, segregation of blood donors, you know, before um, blood apartheid basically ended in a medical sense, but you know, a lot of times people will trust sources like the New York Times on a topic thinking that that's an unbiased view. And we have to step back and realize these are not unbiased views. These are human beings with a bias. And also, more often than not, the journalists are not scientists themselves or are not trained in medicine in order to really be reporting the nuances of um, a scientific study or even a person's um, you know, individual identity. Because as you know, the oversimplification and misrepresentation of me by the media um, shaped millions if not billions of people's minds about who I am and what my character is. Because you'll notice that it wasn't just, is she black or white, but it's like, she's a liar, she's a fraud, she's, you know, all these like negative character traits and then it, there's a snowball effect with racial stereotypes where once you are racialized, then you're connected with a long line of stereotypes about that group and being called, once called a liar, then we can't trust your word on anything and we're gonna go back in time and question everything that you've ever done. We're going to then decide that you have pretended or made up hate crimes um, that you have pretended or falsified, you know, different parts of your life for um, some kind of self-serving purpose, you know, and that then just gets concocted into this mythology about who a person is. So there's a huge amount of mythology about who I am, who who is Rachel Dolezal. There's a there's a myth about that. That's there's a character out there that was created by the media. Um, but meanwhile, I have led a very well considered, very nuanced life. And, um, you know, just like those well considered nuanced scientific studies that have been overly simplified or misrepresented oftentimes in uh, media translation, I have been over 
uh, you know, oversimplified and misrepresented in order to drive up the drama, in order to drive up ratings. And what would that serve? Why would, would the media do that? Money, because ratings are content, ratings are money. And as um, NBC said that the, the actual episode of me on the Today Show with Matt Lauer was the most viewed episode of the Today Show in the entire history of the Today Show. So that actually drove up and brought in a lot of money for NBC. Um, meanwhile, of course, as we now know, you know, Matt Lauer was sitting there so condescending and so judgmental towards me. Well, he was probably like, you know, banging the intern in his locked office. <laughs> I mean, you know, he got fired. And, um, but during that interview, like, you know, I was, I was used as a prop in, in a sense to um, make money for the media. Well, I was actually trying desperately to communicate how my life is nuanced and how I approach the race topic from a very complex and you know educated perspective and my reasons for everything that I've done in life but that was you know not wanted like that narrative was not um not what the media wanted to hear so most of my answers with with regard to academic reasons and academic um discussion on the topic of race have been muted, censored, cut out, edited out, edited out of the Netflix documentary, edited out of TV interviews, um, and so forth. So the purpose is money, you know, Netflix wanna make their money, um, the media wanna make their money, nobody really cares at the end of the day, the human collateral damage, and unfortunately, this is not just about damaging reputations, but when it comes to the race topic in medicine, this also, you know, has a very physical, and real damage when it comes to um, twisting people's ideas of like what drugs they need and so on. So when it comes to politics, it's also, you know, safe to say that not only in media, but also in the political realm, racial categories are primarily for non-health purposes. <laughs> um, so, and even when it comes to media, but like, Racial categories are not, like when somebody says, we have to know your race and your ethnicity and all these different affiliations and where you come from, your ancestry groups and everything else, because we want to take care of you better. That's usually not the intention or the outcome. So filling out race on a form is required, you know, for jobs, for medical appointments, for schooling, for um, the census, for all of these different things. And yet, filling out race on a form is an inadequate reflection of actual genetic variation or medical conditions and factors. So Barbara Koenig talks about how federal guidelines require this self-identification on forms for housing and medicine, education, employment, and so forth. But um, the justification for this is, is claimed to be um, justice. Like we just want to know what group you belong to so that we can um, make sure that we treat you fairly. <laughs> the information provided, however, is most often used for the opposite of justice. So instead of guaranteeing racial equity in schools and healthcare and jobs and housing, we see this information um, collected from these forms used for um, segregating voting districts or um, redlining or gentrification, other political tools. So that information, it, the, the process of racialization is not being used to mete out justice and equity and inclusion. If it was, we'd, we would have arrived at that by now, but over the course of American history, that information has been used instead um, as a way to um, oppress and as a way to divide. So race is emphasized over and over again, but real social solutions to problems are de-emphasized. So you'll notice in 
a lot of the political debates and talk and chatter, even coming up to the presidential election, there'll be a lot of chatter about race as a topic, but you know, you know, we have to kind of sort through that and see like what are the real social solutions to problems in America? Because that's what at the end of the day will make a difference for change and for moving us toward equity and inclusion. So that kind of begs the question at the end of chapter four, what is the appropriate use of race in society or have we outgrown the concept of and the term for race and are we ready to develop new vocabulary around human difference as well as new vocabulary around human commonality? <laughs> um, so maybe the information from this whole lesson you know, clears things up for you. Maybe it just makes things even more complex on the topic, or, you know, maybe you're just not sure what to do with the information because I know a lot of times we get information and then there's kind of a um, dissonance between just knowing something and knowing it and integrating it into your life and acting on it. There's a difference between those two. Like sometimes people will realize or hear information and it sounds good and you but you never do anything about it you just continue you basically act as if you never heard it and you just go about living your life the same way so the question always is when you read a book um, when you hear new information how does that then integrate with your life how does that then change um, you in terms of not just your personal identity but how you behave toward other people how you see the world, um, what your values and priorities are. Uh, I think the power of education is that we have the opportunity to grow and evolve after hearing new information. And especially the type of, you know, really substantial information that's in this book. You'll see at the end of each chapter, this isn't just one book. I mean, it's only not only 21 essays, but at the end of each chapter, there's a huge long list of references for just that one chapter. So there's, you know, a lot of wealth of information um, in this one book, and there are many other books as well with information. So it's not that I expect everyone or anyone uh, really to, you know, protest the race worldview in the same way that I have or that I do. Um, but I think that it's important to consider like what's right for you, what's right for your kids, what's right for your grandkids and the future of society, um, regardless of methods of taking action on knowledge or information. Um, hopefully we can all agree <laughs> that the ultimate goal is to really arrive at a more equitable, more just, more inclusive society. So whatever America chooses to do when it comes to the race worldview, whether we choose to continue to perpetuate it, to scratch it or scrap it all together, to maybe tweak it or change it in a way that divides biological and medical truths from um, social grouping and ways that we treat people. I mean, I think that we've just got to figure it out in terms of how are we going to achieve a more equitable, just, and inclusive society? Um, and how are we gonna achieve that even in our interactions just in daily life with each other and on social media and in school and so forth. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson number two. There is more, we haven't finished yet. So tune back in next time for more about race and culture studies. So for those of you who have already purchased the Doing Race book, um, here are some additional references or sources that you could order if your um, interest is piqued on the topic of medicine, science, and uh, race when it comes to DNA and um, the topic that we discussed today. Fatal Invention and Killing the Black Body by Dorothy Roberts are excellent on this topic. Also on the topic of the race worldview, as something that's not bio race as not being biological the arc of a bad idea by carlos hoyt jr is also a great great book just about um, how this whole race idea has really expired 
and there's a need to um, form new vocabulary around uh, just grouping and um, kind of group belonging and culture and so forth. And then finally, Introduction to African American Studies by Talmadge Anderson. This is a great book that has many chapters about different topics, and there is a topic about um, medicine and kind of the, the technology and the way that that's connected to oppression. So th- these are some references that within each of these books has just a treasure trove of other references as well. So you can just keep digging if you're interested. <laughs> keep learning. So I just wanted to add, in case you're wondering about what's on my wall when I'm doing these discussions or the art that I included in last times, the first lessons PowerPoint, I just include different pieces of my art that I feel like relate to the topic in some way. And this this piece is called Blue Wave, and those are not birds, they're actually bats. So um, there's a saying, the bats in the belfry, meaning somebody's going crazy. And I feel like in some ways, politics in the United States kind of are, are some craziness. <laughs> so there's kind of a red and blue sky with the blue kind of moving forward and the bats kind of flying out from the, the red space and um, the Capitol building flooding and just different things in this particular composition that I feel like are um, kind of a, a visualization of some of the just absurdity of the obsession in America over the race worldview as well as many other political um, issues that you know are focused on and obsessed on without realizing those actual social solutions without substantially changing anything that affects um, everyday citizens there's just a lot of talk a lot of theorization and a lot of things being used for political advantage but you know not a lot of substance in terms of making things better in society, more, more equitable, more just, and more inclusive. Again, that's our ultimate goal, no matter whether you're Democrat or Republican or black or white in America, I do hope that on a human level, we do have that unifying goal for the future.